Hi there. My name is Inshira and welcome to my online course on financial reporting. In these lecture videos, I have divided the syllabus for financial reporting into 22 modules. In other words, we are going to, or you are going to have access to 22 lecture videos in relation to the whole course, talking about various aspects of financial reporting. Attached to these lecture videos also, you will be having study materials. So every video that I'm going to be doing or every video that you're going to be watching, you're going to have access to study materials, downloadable that you can use offline, we all questions that we are going to be solving throughout the course are also made available in the study material so it's a whole package that you are going to take in relation to taking this online course now how have I designed this financial reporting syllabus now I have divided the financial reporting syllabus into five sections so in order to enable you to understand financial reporting very well and to be able to prepare well for the examination we have divided the syllabus into five different sections so you have a section one section two section three section four and then section five in the section one we will be dealing with issues about the regulatory framework of financial reporting this is where we'll be discussing issues about conceptual frameworks and then regulatory frameworks from there we will come to the section two which is one of the key aspects of the syllabus because this is where we'll talk about the various accounting standards that is the international financial reporting standards and international accounting standards so we will deal with the various standards that you have to know of ias 16 ias 17, IAS 20, IAS 23, IAS 12, IAS 8, IAS 2, IAS 38, IAS 36, IAS 40. We will deal with all the standards that you have to understand in that order. Why is that so? Because your ability to understand the standard will help you well to be able to do the next session, which is called financial statement of single entity so under section 3 we are going to look at the financial statement of single entity where we will be looking at the uh, income statements and other comprehensive income we will look at the balance sheet then we will discuss the statement of changes in equity then we will look at uh, the cash flow statement so under section 3 we will be dealing with these aspects or these contents in that order now after we look at the financial statement of single entity the next thing we will do is to discuss issues about the uh, consolidated financial statement of simple group structure so we're going to look at uh, a parent a subsidiary and then an associate okay so that is a simple group structure in that order we're going to look at how we can prepare consolidated statement of profit or loss then consolidated statement of financial position and then consolidated statement of changes in equity so we will do all these in section 3 and then we will conclude our lectures on the section 5 where we talk about analyzing and interpretation of financial statements so these are what we will be going through in the 22 modules that you have divided into various sessions so that you can be able to prepare and take the exams in that order. Now, let me also make this comment that in, in order for you to become successful and be well prepared for the financial reporting exams, you need to be strong when it comes to the section two aspect of the syllabus, that is dealing with the international financial reporting standards and the international accounting standards. Because if you are not strong in understanding and the treatment of the various items under the standards you wouldn't be able to prepare your financial statement very well and that will also impair your understanding in relation to the preparation of simple group financial statements of the company as such i will encourage you to spend enough time watch the videos over and over again in relation to the financial uh, international financial reporting standards and the international accounting standards so that you can be well prepared for the examination so let's begin with the first section that is section one regulatory framework for financial reporting so in the module one we're going to be looking at two things as I mentioned earlier conceptual framework and then uh, we're going to look at regulatory framework of financial reporting so at the end of this module you should be able to understand the purpose of the conceptual framework you should be able to explain the scope of the conceptual framework you should be able to identify and explain briefly the contents and elements of financial statement you should be able to understand the qualitative characteristics of financial statements then you should be able to explain how elements are recognized also in the financial statement so when we talk about 
conceptual framework. What is conceptual framework? The International Accounting Standard Board Framework for Preparation and Presentation of Financial Statements is a statement of generally accepted theoretical principles which form the framework of reference for financial reporting. So when we talk about the conceptual framework, we are talking about the International Accounting Standard Board Framework, which gives guidelines for how financial statements have to be prepared, how items have to be recognized in the financial statement, and even what elements have to be included in the financial statement of organizations. Now, what is the purpose of the framework? What is the purpose of the framework that the International Accounting Standard Board put together? One is to assist the board itself in developing new accounting standards and reviewing existing ones. So the reason why they put together this conceptual framework is to be able to assist the board itself, that is the International Accounting Standard Board, when they are developing new accounting standards or when they are reviewing existing accounting standards. The next thing is that they want or the framework is there to assist the International Accounting Standard uh, Board in relation to harmonizing accounting standards and procedures by providing the basis for reducing the number of alternative accounting treatments permitted by the International Financial Reporting Standard. So it, they, it is there to harmonize and bring into uh, one way how items have to be treated so that we don't have different views in relation to how a company would treat an item and how another company would treat another item. So in a way we want to harmonize and bring a single principle of treatment of items in the financial statements of companies. Third is to assess national standard setting bodies in developing national standards. So the framework sort of serves as a guideline so that national standard setters can also follow it in the setting of standards for the country or the nation. And then the next one is to assist preparers of financial statements and in applying uh, international accounting standards and international financial reporting standards. So it's also to assist financial accountants in the preparation of financial statement management, in the preparation of financial statements, so that they can efficiently and effectively interpret the accounting standards and apply them in relation to the preparation and presentation of financial statements. And then the next one also is to assist users of financial statements in interpreting the financial statements. Okay, so users like we we'll look at users of financial statements. And they are the same as the stakeholders of the organization so that they can well interpret the financial statement and the final thing that we talk about about the purpose of the conceptual framework is to assist or provide those interested in the work of the international accounting standard board with information about its approach to formation of international financial reporting standards so these are what we refer to as the purpose of the framework or the conceptual framework so one Developing and reviewing of existing standard two harmonizing of treatment of uh, standards or transactions three helping uh, national standard setters in setting their standard four helping or assisting preparers of financial statement in applying accounting standards five helping auditors in the carrying out of their work and then six helping users to give an interpretation of the financial statement and then seven helping other parties who may be interested in the job of the international accounting standard board as to how they go about or their approach they use in the setting of their standards then the next question we have to ask ourselves is what is the scope of the framework in other words what what, what does the what, what does this framework cover all right that is what we mean by the scope what what really is the content what really is the element of the framework now the international accounting standard board has explained that the framework consists of seven chapters okay seven chapters so there are seven uh, chapters that relates to the financial or the regulatory sorry the conceptual framework what are these seven uh, chapters or elements or content one is the objectives of financial statements two is the underlying assumptions used in the preparation of financial statement three is the qualitative characteristics of financial statements four is the elements of the financial statement five is the recognition of the elements in the financial statement six is the measurement of the element of the financial statement and seven is the concept of capital and capital maintenance so these are the seven uh, content or chapters that describes the scope of the conceptual framework but in order to be able to understand what a uh, conceptual framework does we need to take all these elements one after the other and discuss them in a bit detail 
So let's look at the objectives of financial statement. Usually, organizations prepare various financial statements. And we're going to be looking at that later on under Section 3. But organizations prepare a lot of financial statements. One, they prepare statements, uh, the income statement and other comprehensive income. They prepare statements of financial position. They prepare the cash flow statement. They prepare um, other uh, notes to the account. It's part of the financial statement of the company. Then they prepare statements of changes in equity. All these are statements of what? Of financial statements of the organization. But what is really the objectives of financial statement? The objective of financial statement is to provide information about the financial position of the organization, the financial performance of the organization, and then changes in the financial position of the organization that is useful in a wide range in making of decisions. So the objective of the financial statement is to one, tell us about the financial performance of the organization. How do we do that? We get the financial performance of the organization by the preparation of the income statement. So that's the first thing, preparation of the income statement. That tells us about the financial performance of the organization. Two, the objective of financial uh, statement is to also inform us or provide information about the financial position of the organization. That is done through the statement of financial position or what we refer to traditionally as the balance sheet. Then also to provide changes in the financial position of the organization. Changes in the financial position of the organization. In other words, when we compare last year's financial statement to this year's financial statement, what is the changes in the financial position of the organization? And that is achieved through the cash flow statement. Or the statement of changes in equity in that order. So that is what we mean by the objectives of financial statement. So that is the first thing you have to understand. The objective of the financial statement is to provide information about financial performance, income statement, financial position, balance sheet or statement of financial position, then changes in the financial position through the cash flow statement and the statement of changes in equity in that order. So that is the first part of the conceptual framework. The second thing is the underlining assumption. Now, in the preparation of financial statements, the framework gives guidelines that there are two basic underlining assumptions that must be used in the preparation of financial statement, that must be used in the recognition of items in the books of accounts of the company. These two, these two underlining assumptions are the accrual basis of accounting. In other words, when financial statements are being prepared, financial statements are going to be prepared using what? The accrual basis the accrual basis in that order. So what is the accrual basis of accounting? The accrual basis of accounting is where items are recognized in the financial statement when cash is not, when cash is, uh, when the transaction takes place, but not necessarily when cash is received or paid. So that is the uh, accrual basis of accounting, where we recognize transaction not when cash is received or paid, but when the transaction actually was, takes place. In other words, you recognize revenue not when you receive physical cash, but once the transaction takes place, you recognize revenue. Then you recognize expenditure not when you actually pay the money, but when the transaction actually takes place in that order. So that is one of the underlying assumptions. And then the second underlying assumption is that Financial statement must be prepared using what we call the going concern, concern, okay, or the going concern basis. The going concern basis simply means that in the preparation of financial statements, accounts are not closed, accounts are not dissolved, rather they are carried forward to the next accounting period. In other words, we have to prepare financial statements in line with disclosing that the business can operate into the foreseeable future. Now, when we say foreseeable future, we don't mean 10 years from now, three, uh, three years from now. What we mean that the business can operate into the next 12 months or the business can exist for the next 12 months and operate efficiently and effectively. So, one is the objective of the financial statement. Two, and these are the underlying assumptions. Accrual basis of accounting in the preparation of financial statement, then going concern basis in the preparation of financial statement. The third chapter or element of the conceptual framework is the qualitative characteristics of financial statements. The framework gives guidelines that financial statements to be useful for users must possess 
four principal qualities or characteristics. So to be to enable the users of financial information or yes, the users of financial information or the stakeholders to use the financial information to make any decision at all, financial statements must possess four principal qualities or characteristics. These four qualities or characteristics have been divided into two in relation to presentation and then to the contents of the financial statement. Under presentation, the framework gives guidelines that the financial statement must be presented in such a way that it will be easily understood by anybody. So understandability and then in the preparation of, in the presentation of financial statement, the financial statement must be prepared in such a way that it can possess the quality of comparability. That is, we can compare the financial statement to this year's financial statement to last year's financial statement, or we can compare the financial statement to other financial statements of companies within the same industry. Then when it comes to the content that must be included in the financial statement, the statements or uh, the content must be relevant. In other words, management or preparers of financial statement should not include any irrelevant information. They must include all relevant information that have the ability to be able to influence the economic decision of the users of the financial information. And then the next characteristic is that it must be reliable. Okay, reliable. So presentation has to be that the financial statement must have uh, must be understandable and then must be comparable but when it comes to the contents to be included in the financial statement it must be first relevant okay it must be you must provide relevant information to the users of financial information so that they can they can take the right decision or they, they can make the correct decision in that order then the second thing is about reliability reliable information is one that is free from material error, error and bias so the information that is included in the financial statement must be reliable in other words it must be free from material errors mistakes and it must be free from bias in other words it must actually represent the true state of affairs of the company now for an information to be reliable there are certain qualities that it must have one is faithful uh, representation information must represent faithfully the effect of the transaction and other events that it purports towards represent so for it to be reliable it must be faithfully represented so that it will reflect actually the true nature of the transaction that it is purports to have reflected for example for instance if a company leases an asset and they record the asset as though the company has bought the asset then that means that faithful representation has not been achieved. In other words, the substance of the transaction or the effect of the transaction is that the asset has been leased, not bought. So if the asset is leased, then technically the asset is not for the company. As such, in the disclosure or in the providing of notes to the account, management or preparers of financial statement must disclose that that asset has been leased and not bought by the company. So if management or preparers of financial statement disclose the leased asset as an asset that has been bought and they don't disclose further information in the notes to their accounts, then faithful representation has not been achieved. Two, to be able to make an information that is relevant, that is free from material errors and bias, it must be complete, so completeness. So financial information will be reliable if it is complete, subject to the constraint of materiality and cost. So all relevant information that must be included in relation to all transactions must be included in the financial statement. That is what we mean by the information being complete in the financial statement. Third is neutrality. This means that any judgment exercised in the preparation of financial statements must be free from bias. In other words, whatever interpretation that the preparers of financial statement or management makes in the preparation of financial statement must be neutral, not to, re not to favor them, not to show that the company is doing well if the company is not actually doing well. So if it must represent the true state of affairs of the company. And then the final one is that the, uh, for if an information to be reliable, it must be prudent. In other words, this demands the exercise of caution in estimating the outcome of uncertain events. In other words, 
uh, th there is this is what we call the prudence concept or the conservative concept, where um, we, we we exercise some level of judgment when certain events have not happened. Like for instance, provision for bad debt, provision for depreciation, contingent assets, contingent liability. What we are saying here is that because those events are uncertain, when management is making provisions for them in the financial statement, they must exercise caution in making those explanations in the financial statement. So this is the second aspect of, uh, this is the third session in relation to talking about the content of the, or the elements of the conceptual framework. The fourth thing is about elements of financial statements. The elements of financial statements. Now, there are basically about four or five elements of financial statement generally. We have assets, we have liabilities, we have equity, we have income, and we have expenses. So what is an asset? It's very important here. An asset is a resource that is controlled by an entity as a result of past events from which future economic benefits flows to the entity. Get it well. So an asset is a resource that is controlled by the entity as a result of what past events. So an asset is not something that belongs to the entity technically, but it's an asset that it's a resource that the organization has control over it, okay? And then as a result of having that control, as a result of past events, so they entered or they gained that control by buying the asset or by signing a certain contract. But future economic benefit from that asset, that is the usage of that asset, any income that is generated on that asset will flow directly to the entity in that order. That is what we refer to as an asset. So control is not technically to be able to control an asset, it doesn't mean you don't you own the asset, but rather control is the ability to obtain the economic benefit and to restrict the access of usage of the asset or the to restrict access of you the usage of the asset to other uh, individuals. In other words, you don't gain control of the asset by technically owning the asset. That is why you can lease an asset. Technically, you have not, you don't have ownership of the asset, but once you have leased the asset and it is a finance lease or a capital lease, that means that you now have control of the, over the asset, you now depreciate the asset, you now take care of the asset, so you benefit from the asset in that order. Then, liabilities. A liability is a present obligation of an entity arising from past events, the settlement of which will result in an outflow from the economic resources embodying the organization. So when we talk about a liability, it's a present obligation as a result of what past events, the settlement for which will result into an outflow of economic benefits from the entity. So an asset is a resource that the organization controls as a result of past events, uh, from which future economic benefit flows to the entity. But a liability is a present obligation as a result of past events, the settlement of which will result into an outflow of economic benefit from the entity. So an asset, there will be benefits coming into the company by a liability is something you are owing, a, a debt you are owing as a result of a decision you took in the past in that order. The third thing is about equity. Equity is simply the residual interest in the assets of the entity after deducting all liability. So the equity of the company, it's simply the assets of the company minus the liability of the company. So when we subtract all liabilities from the assets of the company, we get our equity. Then the last two definitions to look at is about income. Income can be defined as the increase in economic benefit during the accounting period in the form of inflows or enhancement of assets or decrease of liability that results in the increase in equity, other than those relating to contributing from equity participation. So an income is simply the increase in the economic benefit of what? An organization. Then an expenses is a decrease in the economic benefit. So income increases how much money we have Directly or indirectly may increase the assets that we have, and so by that one, it will increase what the equity that we have. But expenses is going to decrease the asset that we have because we're going to be paying money out, and technically we're going to reduce what our equity in that order. So these are what you have to understand when it comes to 
the elements of financial statement and we are going to expand on each of these later on in the course talking about assets in detail talking about um, liabilities in detail talking about equity in more detail talking about income and expenses also in a very detailed manner then the fifth chapter of the conceptual framework is recognition of the elements of financial statements how do we recognize elements in the financial statements but the first thing we have to ask ourselves is now we will be coming to session two which is about accounting standards in doing accounting standards there are three things that you have to do you have to look at recognition you have to look at measurement basis then you have to look at disclosure requirements so when we talk about recognition of elements in the financial statement we are looking at a process of incorporating in the financial statement um, an item which meets the definition of the element and satisfy the following criteria for recognition so for an item to be recognized in a financial statement simply means to incorporate it in other words to bring it into the financial statement however for anything to be recognized in the financial statement be it income be it an expense be it an asset be it a liability or be it an equity to for it to be recognized in the financial statement there are two recognition criteria one it is probable that any future economic benefit associated with the item will flow to or will flow from the entity so any economic benefit relating to the asset or relating to the item either uh, out or coming in it's from the entity or to the entity relates to the entity so if there is any item that uh, the benefit of that item does not flow to the entity but flows to directors does not flow to the entity but flows to some other part, third parties then we can recognize that item as part of the item in the financial statement two the item has a value that can be reliably measured so the first thing is that future economic benefits must either flow to the entity or flow from the entity and the second thing is that the item value must be reliably measured in that order so these are the two recognition criteria for um, identifying elements in the financial statement and we will be going through these very well in the section 2 when we are discussing issues about the financial reporting standards and the international accounting standards then the, five, the sixth one is the measurement of elements of financial statements. Now, there are various ways through which various elements can be measured in the financial statements. But measurements can be defined as the process of determining the monetary amount at which an element in the financial statement are to be recognized and carried in the financial statement for the company. So when we talk about measurement, we are talking about the process of determining the what? the monetary value at which an item has to be carried in the statement of financial position or in the income statements of the organization so the monetary value the determination of the monetary value is what we mean by measurement but the framework goes ahead to explain some measurement bases that are used in a financial statement the first one is called the historical cost assets are recorded at the amount of cash and cash equivalent paid or the fair value of the consideration given to acquire them. So historical cost simply means that we are carrying the item at the price which we bought it in the past. Okay, so if we bought an asset for $10 million, historical cost concept simply means that we will carry the asset at that value minus any accumulated depreciation in that case. Two is the current cost basis. Assets are carried at the, at the amount of cash or cash equivalent that would have been paid if the same or an equivalent asset was acquired currently so current cost accounting or current basis is where you are recognizing the items in the financial statement not according to how much you bought it but according to how much it is worth today in other words the fair value of the assets today in that order third one is realizable value this is the amount of cash and cash equivalent that could currently be obtained by selling an asset in an orderly, disposable, or 
the undiscounted amount of cash and cash equivalent expected to be paid to satisfy the liability in a normal course of business. So sometimes we can recognize an item in the financial statement using what we call the realizable value. If it is an asset, then the realizable value is how much we will get if we sell the asset. So re usually realizable value is the selling price of the asset minus the cost to sell. So how much we're going to sell, we will get if we sell the asset today, that is what realizable value is. But if it's about liability, then we are looking at the undiscounted cash and cash equivalent that we expect to pay in order to settle that liability. And then the last one is the usage of present value of future cash flow. This refers to the current estimate of the present discounted value of future net cash flows in a normal course of the business. So with present values, this is where we speculate. Normally, we will be using that under IAS 36 where we are looking at impairment of assets and we are looking at the expected cash flows from a cash generating unit. So you look at that the fact that I'm going to use this asset for 10 years. For these 10 years, I'm going to generate X amount of money. Then you discount it in present value and you carry it in the financial statement we are going to also use the concept of present value in treating items in relation to IES 37 that is provisions in that order when we are making provision for environmental costs and other things we would have to discount it to present value and recognize it in the financial statement and then unbind it or rewind it in or amortize it over the useful life of the uh, uh, transaction or of the cost of the item in the financial statement so these are the six things that are contained in the uh, conceptual framework. The seventh one is the concept of capital and capital maintenance. Capital and capital maintenance. Now, when we talk about capital and capital maintenance, financial capital maintenance is where profit is earned only if the financial statement or money amount of the net assets at the end of the period exceeds the financial or money amount of net assets at the beginning of the period. So capital maintenance, a recognizing of financial statement or the concept of capital maintenance simply means that we only make profits by comparing assets at the start of the year and then assets at the end of the year. So in other words, profit is how much assets we were having at the end of the year minus how much asset or how much asset we are having at the end of the year minus how much asset we are having at the start of the year that is where we can say we have made a profit in that order that is the financial maintenance then we come to what we call physical capital maintenance this is where profit is earned if the physical production or productive capacity of the enterprise at the end of the year exceeds the physical production capacity at the beginning of the year so physical capital maintenance is where we look at the fact that our production capacity, our production uh, uh, procedures, is it more at the end of the year than at the start of the year, then it means we have made a profit in that order. Then the final thing to be talked about is in relation to current purchasing power. Um, we will be using this more, or you will appreciate this more, when you are doing corporate reporting, when we are talking about these issues there. But we still have to discuss it here because it is part of the conceptual framework. So methods of accounting, we have what we call the current purchasing power. The current purchasing power accounting adjusts non-monetary item in historical cost by general price index so, re so re profit is recorded or recognized after allowing for maintenance of purchasing power. What do we mean? Purchasing power simply means that we, in, re, in the recognition of items, or in the recognition of items in the financial statement, what we do is that we will take into consideration general price index. So we're going to be using the historical cost. So if we bought something uh, $10 million two years ago, what has been the general price index, or what has been an inflation on that asset, so that now we will use that index to recognize or to report the financial statement or the item in the financial statement today then current cost accounting so we have what we call current purchasing power then the current cost accounting in current cost accounting profit is the surplus after allowing for price changes on fund needed to continue the existing business and maintaining or maintain operating capacity of the organization that is what we mean by the current cost accounting so these are the seven elements or the seven 
contents or chapters that are contained in the conceptual framework of the International Accounting Standard Board. To conclude this module on the conceptual framework, we have to look at the various accounting concepts that businesses use. And I have already spoken about two of them. That is the accrual basis and then the going consent basis. And I've also spoken about the prudence concepts. But other um, um, accounting concepts are the substance over form. Substance over form. Now, substance over form simply means that in the recognition of financial or items in the financial statement, we recognize the substance of the transaction over the legal form of the transaction. What does that mean? For instance, if the company leases an asset, and we will do, do leases later on in Section 2, IAX 17, when a company leases the asset and the asset is a finance lease or what we call capital lease, then the company must... Uh, treat or recognize the that transaction in the financial statement by looking at the substance of the transaction and not really the legal form. The reason is that if you lease an asset, the asset doesn't belong to you. So legally, you don't own the asset. You don't have title ownership of the asset. So the asset still belongs to the lessor, that is the individual or the company from whom you lease the asset. As such, by law, you are not supposed to include or add that as part of the things you own. But in accounting, we are going to record the substance of the transaction. What is the substance of the transaction? The substance of the transaction means that once you have now leased the asset, you, have, you are now responsible for the risks and the maintenance of the assets. You are now responsible to take care of the asset. So by virtue of the fact that you are now going to take care of the asset, you are now going to maintain the asset, you are now going to pay all property rates of the asset, you are now going to depreciate the asset, there is a transfer of risks and ownership by that uh, thing or by that transaction. So you will record the substance of the transaction over the legal form of the transaction. So by law or in the face of the law, you don't qualify to recognize that financial statement as your own. But remember what we said under assets. Assets are uh, resources that a company can control. So once we can control the asset that we have leased, we must recognize it using the substance over form in that order. So we have the materiality concept, we have the comparability concept, we have the prudence concept, we have the matching and accrual concept, and I have already explained all these concepts to you in that order. So these are what you have to understand when we talk about the conceptual framework of accounting.